Hello, this is Sean, one of the midwives, and I'm going to be going over the um, breastfeeding and a little bit of newborn care um, class today in English. So um, we call it the fourth trimester because um, trimesters, you know, last for about three months and it takes a good three months or more for a baby to really transition over um, uh, into that newborn and um, infant first year of life stage. So. Um, it's just a common um, thing for for us to refer to those first several months of transition as the fourth trimester. Um, talking about breastfeeding, some of the benefits of breastfeeding for mom um, are bonding with her baby. Of course, it saves you money because it's free. Um, postpartum weight loss this maybe doesn't apply to everybody, but um, oftentimes moms will lose weight when they're breastfeeding because you use so much energy and burn so many calories um, by making milk, producing milk and breastfeeding. Health benefits for mom, lower risk of postpartum hemorrhage, lower breast and ovarian cancer risk, lower risk of osteoporosis, and diabetes. Benefits for baby, of course, it's a great nutritional value, um, protects from illness because any antibodies that mom has, she will pass to her baby. Um, so if you um, get the flu or a cold or anything like that, you as the mom, you are building antibodies in your body and you pass that to your baby so that your baby will either have you know, a lesser um, version of that illness or not get it at all. Um, it's more easily digested um, than formula. You know, a lot of times when you switch from breastfeeding to formula, you might notice a little period of constipation just while their digestive system really digests to that change. Um, breast milk is very easily digested for a baby. Bonding also for baby um, and the mom because they spend very close skin to skin time with you with breastfeeding. Uh, there are some studies that show that babies that breastfeed do have a slightly higher IQ, um, and then it lowers baby's risk for sudden infant death syndrome, which is SIDS, diabetes, asthma, allergies, cancers, obesity, ear infections, respiratory infections, lowers the risk for basically any kind of illness, so it's good for babies. Breast milk um, does change over time. At first, we know that it's called colostrum. That's the first three to five days after birth until your actual milk comes in. Very, very little milk, um, uh, like quantity of milk, um, exists with colostrum. You average 30 mLs, which is one ounce. That means in a total of 24 hours after the birth, you will only produce one ounce of milk or colostrum. That's like nothing. Um, that makes sense um, as to why babies tend to want to eat all the time because they're literally getting one ounce over a whole 24 hours. So. It is everything that they need and um, it's perfect for them and you do not need to supplement more than that. Um, colostrum is clear to golden color. It's very thick consistency, very saturated in um, high um, and high in fat soluble vitamins. It's baby's first natural immunization because again, it's passing whatever um, antibodies and um, antibodies that you have is being passed to the baby. It's a very small volume to match baby's stomach volume because baby's stomachs are very, very small, which is also why they eat all the time. Um, it's preparing baby's stomach for digestion because it's a natural laxative um, that helps feed the passage of meconium, which is that first poop that we'll talk about in a little bit. And it's really high in growth factors. Babies grow a ton in those first, well, really months, but even in the first week or two, they just grow so much. So. It's um, amazing for your baby and it's everything that your baby needs, even though the quantity isn't there, the consistency, the thickness of it, and the concentration of the nutrition in those tiny drops is, is huge. Transitional milk, that this is usually when your milk um, starts to come in around between three to five days after birth, your breast will start feeling fuller. Um, and that's how you'll know, or one of the ways you'll know that your milk is coming in. And this lasts about two weeks after the birth. Um, you average up to 500 ml per day, so that's like um, the size of a um, one of those water bottles you get at the store um, that you you know toss and or drink and toss every day. Um, that's 500 ml, so that's how much in one day total that they're going to get. It's lighter in color. It continues to give them natural protection. Um, it has essential active enzymes and hormones. It changes in composition, feed to feed, um, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. The more often baby feeds, the more your breasts make. This is huge. Um, probably maybe the most important thing to learn in this class is um, the concept of supply and demand. And the more often they feed, the more milk you will make. The less often they feed or the more you skip feeds or um, the longer you sleep at night or they sleep at night, the less milk you're going to make. 
Um, this is always the, this is also the time period where a lot of people experience baby blues, um, which is just that time period about up to two weeks after the birth where you're just kind of having lots of ups and downs emotionally. You might find yourself crying for no reason. Um, you know, you're running on lack of sleep um, and you're tired and you're it's hard work and you're emotional and um, you know this is just a normal a normal transition after birth is the baby blues period which is different from postpartum depression and we'll talk about that mature milk starts producing at about 10 or sorry 14 days after the birth you're never going to notice you know the change in the milk unless you pump um, into bottles and you might notice um, the change in the bottle of the consistency of the milk or the color of the milk but otherwise if you're just exclusively breastfeeding you know, you're not going to notice like a change um, from one day to the next or one week to the next with your milk, but it does change. Um, so around two weeks, you'll start to get between 500 and 1100 mLs per day. So up to a liter per day, 24 hours in a day um, that you'll produce. Um, the milk turns white or bluish color. It's a lot thinner. The fat content changes feed to feed. Um, it produces exactly what your baby needs. Your body knows how much fat, how much protein, how much um actual hydration, like it just meets the perfect needs of your baby every time, every feed. Um, it will meet all of your baby's needs for the first six months of life. So you don't need to um, give baby food or anything for the first six months, only breast milk. Um, it continues to provide, provide nutrition and protection after introducing other foods. So you can, you know, there's all kinds of um, different ways that people do extended breastfeeding. Some people breastfeed for a year, two years, three years, four years, five years. You can breastfeed as long as you want. Um, so the longer you breastfeed, the greater the protection for the baby, and it does change in composition feed to feed, and we'll talk about that in a second. So this is kind of like the difference in um, milk. Um, it does change feed to feed, but it also changes, changes during the feed. So the fore milk is the milk at the beginning of a feed, and the hind milk is the milk at the end of a feed. Again, you're never going to know. It's not like a sudden change. You're never going to like see the difference of um, what's four milk and what's high milk. And it doesn't matter. You don't, you don't have to worry about your baby um, getting both of these. Um, the transition is really gradual. Um, so as long as you empty the breast and let the baby finish um, on each side, or if you're pumping, make sure you um, continue pumping until the, the dripping like um, really slows down a lot. Um, your breasts truly are never completely empty, but um, you'll know you'll know you'll know when they're empty. They feel empty. You're, if you're pumping, you won't. Not much will be coming out anymore. Um, and if baby's done, then he's emptied it. Um, babies do need a balance of both hind milk and fore milk for proper growth and development. The fore milk is um, a lot thinner um, in consistency. It is more hydrating. It really quenches the baby's thirst, contains lactose and protein, and it's not very high in calories or fat. Towards the end of the feed, the hind milk, it's thick, it's creamy, it's really high in fat and calories, um, and um, your baby will, will get both of those if you allow it to finish on each breast. A newborn stomach capacity, um, it's extremely small. The first day, it's about the size of a key lime, then about the size of an olive. Um, around three days, then around a week old, it's the size of an apricot, and then around one month, it's still only the size of an egg. Um, so this is why your baby, you feel like your baby wants to eat all the time, because if you think about it, you know, an adult, they say our um, stomachs are the size of like our fist, and we eat, what, every four, five hours, something like that-ish, our meals, you know, are about five hours apart. Um, and we have a stomach the size of a fist. So think of a baby and, um, you know, we want them to be on our routine and we want to have breaks and, and eventually they do get there. But, you know, when they're first born, their stomachs are just very, very small. Um, so that's why, you know, they're, they're constantly um, putting colostrum in and then it's moving out and then they're hungry again. And then same thing. So the milk is constantly flowing through the stomach and um, that's why they are hungry pretty often. Um, the breastfeeding physiology, so how does it work? Um, it's all a hormone cycle between your breasts and your brain and um, the hormones in between. So basically, when you put the baby on the breast, um, hormones are stimulated from, um, from the nipple stimulation from the baby. So once the baby starts sucking on your nipple, your brain recognizes that and um, starts producing um, prolactin and oxytocin. Um, which 
the oxytocin, sorry, the prolactin is what increases the milk production. So it makes more milk because it knows that your baby is eating. So it's making it for now and for the next time. And then the oxytocin is what stimulates that letdown reflex, which is um, just the reflex of when your milk actually lets down from further back in your breasts and releases it to go forward and come out of your nipple. Um, so the baby roots, sucks, swallows, locates the nipple, tactile recept receptors in the nipple are activated. Your brain knows, hypothalamus, which is in the brain, sends impulses to the anterior and posterior pituitary gland. Anterior pituitary gland <coughs> <coughs> causes prolactin to make milk. And then the posterior pituitary gland releases that milk with the, um, with the force of oxytocin. Um, the supply and demand process, again, this is probably like one of the most important things about this um, class. Um, so basically, the milk production is stimulated because your baby cries, you put it on the breast, great. So now it's your brain knows to produce milk, the, mom, the brain releases hormones, it causes the milk to be released, and the, empty, the infant then empties the breast. Then your brain knows there's also um, receptors that tell your brain that the breast is empty. and so. Um, your brain knows how much the baby fed that time and will and will continue to produce that same amount for the next time that the baby feeds. So, um, you know, it goes this way um, and it also kind of goes the opposite way in that if your baby cries and you don't put the baby on the breast or, you know, let's say you give a bottle, you're tired, you want to you want to take a nap, you know, you tell your husband or your partner or whoever to give the baby a bottle and you skip that feed, your breasts stay full, assuming you don't pump and empty them, then your breasts stay full. Well, same thing, it sends a signal to your brain that says, oh, the baby didn't need that milk that time. And so over time, if you continue doing that, um, your body will produce less milk and therefore your baby will get less milk. Um, so this is kind of the issue, I guess, when people, when babies start sleeping through the night or when you just want to sleep through the night and so you give your baby a bottle during the night and skip emptying your breasts, anytime you skip emptying your breasts, um, your milk supply will be affected by that. So it's always important to every single time the baby eats um, and demands milk that you that you put him to the breast so that your body will continue to produce um, the sufficient amount that your baby needs. So the first few days, um, how to establish a good milk supply, again, it's supply and demand. So you're gonna have a great milk supply if every time your baby cries and is hungry, you put him on the breast. Um, you, if you empty the breast with each feeding and then offer the other breast um, each time, not all, you know, not all babies will take both, both breasts every time and that's okay, um, but we should always offer um, both to the baby. Um, staying close to baby and skin to skin, watching for hunger cues, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, feeding at least every two to three hours, which I know feels like all the time. Um, but we really, especially those first several days or even week or two, um, it's so, so important to just um, to meet the demand of the baby so that your body will produce enough milk. Um, baby sometimes feels like it wants to nurse like the whole 24 hours. It's not literally going to nurse for 24 hours, but it feels like that. It feels like that when you're tired and you feel like you're not getting a break, you're not getting rest, you're not getting a nap, you don't have time for a shower, you barely have time to eat. Like it just feels like it's nearly all the time, but that's completely normal um, to be expected really um, for a lot of babies um, in the first few days. So it's so, so important to just it doesn't mean the baby's not getting enough. We'll talk about how we know the baby's getting enough here in a minute, but just because the baby's crying and wanting to feed all the time does not mean they're not getting enough. That's just a normal newborn behavior with breastfeeding. Um, you know, I know we, we think that when we feed bottles or we feed formula that we can just give a couple ounces right away and it'll sleep for a few hours. Um, but babies don't need a couple ounces. That's, that's too much for the baby um, in the first few days of life. So, um, you know, if we just put the baby on the breast every time it demands it, it will feed as much as it wants and then it'll, it'll stop when it's finished. So if we follow the baby's lead, then um, you will produce enough milk. How do you know if your baby's hungry? So this is just like a little scale of green to red. Um, in the very beginning, they're licking their lips, they're making sucking sounds, um, opening their mouth, sticking their tongue out. They start to try to suck and root on everything like they're, you know, the blanket, they open their mouth and uh, like try to try to touch the blanket, try to suck on the blanket, try and suck on anything nearby. Then they start to put their hands in their mouth. They start to get fidgety, squirmy, and starting to get 
like like grunty and um, panting. They start to position themselves for nursing, and then they get really mad. They get fussy, frantic, agitated, crying, turning red, screaming. Um, ideally, we want to start feeding a baby in the green zone or like green to yellow maybe uh, as soon as it wakes up because it's really hard, especially in the beginning, um, to put a baby on the breast when it's screaming and crying and its hands are here and you're, you only have two hands and you need five and um, it's just really difficult once they're already really upset. So ideally, if we can get them on when they're very first showing signs of hunger, um, it's better for you and for the baby. A good latch versus a poor latch. Um, a good latch, uh, baby's mouth, you can see in this picture on the left, baby's mouth is wide open. Baby's tongue, you're not going to see baby's tongue, um, but the tongue is over the lower gum. Baby's lips are curled out, flanged out like a fish. Um, baby's chin is firmly touching your breast, whereas the second picture, baby's mouth is barely open. Again, you can't see the tongue, but it's behind the gums. Um, baby's lips are like curled in, looks like he's like giving her a kiss instead of looking like a fish. Um, and baby's chin barely touched your breast. You can also see in the picture on the left that the baby has most of that brown um, areola in his, in his mouth. That's a good thing. It needs to have a really deep latch like that. It needs a lot of the breast tissue in his mouth. And the picture on the right um, does not have a lot of the areola in his mouth. It really only has the nipple. And um, that is going to be extremely painful for you in about 24 hours if your baby is feeding like that. Um, so... Yeah, these are good. Yeah, these are good pictures. Um, latch, and then again, right here, um, how to get a good latch. First of all, for mom to be relaxed. Um, we always tell moms to have um, like a place that you go to breastfeed, whether that's like on the sofa or recliner or in a spot on your bed or, you know, a rocking chair in the baby's room, wherever that is, like kind of find that place in those first few days and just stick to it so that you can always have your pillows there and, you know, your water bottle beside you and some snacks and, um, uh, whatever it is that um, keeps you most comfortable and relaxed for your baby. Um, baby should be showing hunger cues because we want the baby to be hungry. Tummy to tummy. Um, I think a lot of people want their baby to lay, like they hold it, you know, in their arms like this, and the baby's really, their back is flat and they're kind of looking up, and then they have to turn their head to, to latch right. That's not ideal. The ideal way is for you to turn the baby so that their stomach faces your stomach and they're just face, um, you know, facing straight on to the nipple. Um, like the first picture, nose to nipple. The nose should be at the level of the nipple. The nipple and the areola should be in the baby's mouth. Um, the lips should be flanged or flared like a fish, and there should be no sharp pain, um, no sharp pain at all. Um, in the well, in the very beginning, when the baby first latches, sometimes you feel um, pain, I guess, for the first like 10, maybe 15 seconds. But if it doesn't go away, it's a problem, um, and you should you know, put your finger in the side of the baby's mouth to um, break the suction and make it start over. Um, you know, breastfeeding is a learning process and that the latch is included in that. Some babies, you know, are, are lucky and moms are lucky and it's just never an issue and they just latch perfectly, but a lot of babies just need a little bit of help with that latch um, in those first few days. So it's important that you um, help them to learn how to latch by making them come off um, and and start over. Press crawl. Let's see if this video will work. No. Okay. Um, so this is a video. Um, you can go, uh, YouTube it. The, you can YouTube the breast crawl. And basically, this is a video of a baby who is just born, um, like within an hour ago. And um, they basically just leave the baby to be like this on its own, on its mom's breast and her chest. And the baby, over the course of like 10 minutes or so of the video at least, um, finds its way, like literally like bops its head over and finds its way to its mother's breast and just starts sucking. And she doesn't put her hands on the baby, she never positions the baby, she never, she never does anything, the baby just does it on its own. And um, basically the whole point of the video is that if we, that it's an innate uh, natural thing for a baby to do is to breastfeed and um, if we give it time and if we're patient and we just allow it to happen, just like every other mammal, you know, think about a horse or pigs on the farm or dogs or cats, they all just find that they don't even have their eyes open and they all find their way to their mom's breast or nipples. Um, so it's just a normal thing that if we just um, don't intervene and are patient that they will really figure it out on their own as well. Um, so just a really cool video to see. Um, challenges with breastfeeding, what to do if baby won't latch. Um, first of all, is baby hungry? 
Um, maybe they're crying for other reasons. Maybe they need a diaper change. Maybe they're just tired. Maybe they're cold. Maybe they just want you to hold them. Um, you know, oftentimes, of course, babies do cry because they're hungry, but that's not the only reason they cry. So if they're not demonstrating hunger cues, maybe we should rule out, you know, some other reasons why they might be crying. Um, baby might not latch because your breasts are engorged. Engorged just means like really full and swollen um, from a lot of milk being inside. Um, and so we will talk about engorgement here in a little bit too, but hand expressing um, or pumping can, can help relieve that engorgement. And we'll talk about that. Um, is baby tired? Um, you know, sometimes moms will tell us, I can't get him to latch. He just won't wake up. He just sleeps all the time. Um, so it's important to um, not have the baby wrapped up in like five blankets and a hat and and your mittens and their onesie and their footy pajamas and their it, like when they're too comfortable, they don't want to wake up. So um, stimulate the baby, take off the baby's hat, rub its hair, rub its feet, rub its belly, rub its rub anything. Um, undress and place it skin to skin. Sometimes you have to get baby down all the way to its diaper. Um, and just put it straight on you. If you are skin to skin with your baby, your baby will stay warm. Um, undressing sometimes is um, necessary for, for babies to wake up enough to feed. If you feel like the baby is falling asleep every time and can't seem to complete a feed, or if you just really can't get them to wake up like at all, they just seem to have no energy. They're very, um, we call it lethargic. Like they just have they just seem to have no energy. Like they literally can't keep their eyes open. Um, and that can be a big red flag. So if you are concerned about how much your baby's sleeping, then please call us um, right away. Not producing enough milk. So it's possible, but pretty rare for a woman to not produce enough milk, um, aside from not producing enough because they're not feeding enough. Um, so can't, So not producing enough can be due to infrequent feeding so instead of feeding every two to three hours, maybe you're feeding every three to four hours, or maybe you went five or six hours that night, you know, and they're only two days old or something like that. Um, having a poor latch sometimes, sometimes it looks like the baby has a good latch on the outside, but something's going on on the inside, like a tongue tie or something else. Um, so sometimes it looks like baby should be getting enough, but if they're not, then we need to figure out, you know, what's going on with their latch. Because if they don't have a good latch, they're not going to be able to... Um, express that milk and get it out. And then if they're not getting it out, that means your breast is not emptying. And therefore with that cycle, again, if your breast isn't emptying, then your body is thinking your baby doesn't need it. And it's not producing, it's not creating that cycle and that flow. So baby has to actually empty the breast or pretty well into the breast regularly um, for your body to continue to produce a sufficient amount. Bottle feeding before milk is established. We highly discourage this. Um, I know it's tempting, you know, when you're tired and you're frustrated and you can't get the latch to work and it, maybe you're in pain and, um, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why people give formula. Um, but doing that or giving a bottle at all before, even if it's a bottle of breast milk, um, giving a bottle before milk is established can sometimes cause some nipple confusion with the baby and kind of further contribute to a latch problem. Um, and so that can also... Again, if you're giving a bottle and you're not putting the baby on and you're not emptying your breast sufficiently, then your, your supply will go down. Medications, certain medications can decrease milk supply. We will always tell you if you're on a medication that does that or if you need to be on a medication that does that, um, or we'll try to find you an alternative to um, if you are on a medication or need a medication that does that. Stress can um, decrease your supply. Physiologic disease um, of the mother, just certain health conditions can um, make your supply lower and um, history of breast surgery can um, have um, can you know affect your milk supply so if you do have a history of breast surgery if you haven't already told us please tell us or your provider that you are see somewhere else um, it might it's probably um, going to be a really good idea for you to see um, a lactation consultant afterwards um, especially if you have any um, concerns about your production um, please call us, always call us. You're always going to have our number um, after the baby's born. Of course, we're going to see you for home visits, um, but in, you know, in between those visits or before we ever see you for that first visit, um, if you don't think you have enough, then, then please call us so we can troubleshoot you. Engorgement. Um, this was one of the challenges we talked about a minute ago. Um, that's when your breasts, like you can see in this picture, her breasts are very, very full. Um, the skin is very tight, and it's just hard for a baby to latch onto that. 
Um, it's important that you continue nursing. Um, don't skip feedings because your boobs are very hard and swollen. Um, you can massage, you can hand express to relieve that pressure. You can use cool compresses to reduce the swelling and discomfort. You can also use warm compresses or a hot shower right before you feed the baby um, to kind of help soften the breasts um, to put the baby on. You can take ibuprofen for also the swelling and the pain. Uh, purple cabbage leaves, that's just like a natural way that you can um, help decrease inflammation in the breasts. And minimal pumping. So I think people think because they're so engorged, they're natural um thought and the natural thing they want to do is to empty their breasts because engorgement hurts and it's not comfortable and um it's not fun um and so you think that if you pump and just empty them that that will make it better well it does temporarily but again we go back to supply and demand you just demanded because you emptied yourself with a pump so you just demanded essentially all that milk from your body so what does your brain think Oh, the baby needed that. So it produces the same amount again. So you, you just end up in this awful, <laughs> uncomfortable cycle of engorgement and pumping and engorgement and pumping because you're emptying it and your body's going to keep producing it if you keep emptying it. So um, the only reasons we would recommend to pump with engorgement is just to pump for relief. So that means to pump for like maybe five minutes at the most, um, just so that you just so that that swelling goes down just enough that you don't feel all that pressure um, and that um, it'll soften your breast just enough so that baby can latch on. But in general, if you just keep nursing and you allow the baby to finish when it's done, to start when it's ready, your baby will regulate your milk supply again over the next you know, few days after you experience that engorgement. A lot of times engorgement can happen um, if you have a really good milk supply. This can happen around day like three to five when your milk really comes in. It can also happen at other times, but um, definitely days three to five if you are if you have a big supply that comes in all at once, which is a good thing. That's a great thing to have is a well-established supply. Um, but if you just give it a few days and keep latching on your baby, your baby will regulate that um, milk supply with your brain. Um, nipple pain. So if you do have pain, um, the pain can be from sore, cracked, bleeding nipples. Um, usually this is because of a latch problem. Not always, but usually it's because of a latch. So uh, we can fix the latch by changing the position of the baby. In a minute here, we'll talk about different positions to nurse your baby in. Um, but you can nurse him laying this way. You can nurse him laying this way down to the side. You can nurse him sitting upright and um, facing you. You can lay down to your side and nurse the baby. There's all kinds of positions you can nurse your baby in, not just, you know, holding it like this, like like you see a typical person holding a baby in a picture. Um, so we definitely need to evaluate the latch. Sometimes there's a tongue tie. Um, you know, ourselves, your pediatrician, another lactation consultant, you know, can evaluate um, for a tongue tie and make recommendations on that. There's possible that there's an infection, something like a yeast infection causes a lot of pain. Um, so all kinds of reasons for nipple pain, but I feel like probably the most common is latch. So. If you feel like you are having pain, then definitely let us know, or we can get you an appointment with lactation um, and um, to evaluate what, what's causing your pain. Um, how to care for your nipples. Let them air dry after they feed. That's probably the best way for them to um, to heal. So if you just um, if you hand express just a little bit, a couple drops of milk onto your nipples after you're done feeding. Um, and just literally let it dry there for a few minutes before you put your bra back on or your shirt back on. Um, that will really help. Your, your, your milk has natural antibodies, antifungal, antimicrobial, like all kinds of properties that um, it will help to self-heal. Um, there's also all kinds of ointments and creams out there on the market. Lanolin is like the purple tube. That's probably, that's a pretty popular one. There's all kinds of natural nipple ointment. Mother Love is one um, company. Regular coconut oil from the kitchen or HB can be used. There's gel pads. Um, different brands produce these gel pads that you can keep in the fridge and place on your nipples um, between feeds. They're just very soothing um, and they help um, healing because sometimes when you put those um, disposable pads or even the reusable like cotton pads like between your nipples and your bra, sometimes if, especially if you have cracked nipples they just um, can kind of get stuck there and then it hurts to take them off and anyway just Again, it's a big cycle of pain. So um, if you can use those gel pads, they don't stick at all, and they just slide right off, and they're very soothing. 
we can um, also give you a prescription or give you a sample of our prescription of apno cream. Apno stands for all-purpose nipple ointment. So if we think there is some sort of an infection or there's just a pretty deep cut or something like that, we can always use that as well. Um, please, if you're having nipple pain and it hasn't gone away with like your own, you know, strategies of fixing the latch or the positioning or whatever, please just give us a call or the lactation care center because we need to get somebody to see you um, to evaluate that pain. Breast and nipple infections. Um, we're going to talk about all of these plug ducts, mastitis, and thrush. Mastitis um, is when you have a set, it usually is caused by a poor latch, um, nip, uh, nipple damage, um, or infrequent emptying of the breast. So sometimes a plug duct is, sorry, mastitis is caused by a plug duct, which is when um, milk kind of like, like clots or like gets, um, I don't know, it clots, like the milk literally just like clots inside your breasts and um, it can cause an infection because it basically just sits there and like festers and like gets gross. So that can cause um, an infection eventually if you don't get that plug duct out. Um, but just having a bad latch and nipple damage, any kind of nipple damage is like an open wound and therefore bacteria can just um, come inside through, you know, you keep your breasts in a bra and it's warm and it's moist and it's dark and it's just like, prime breeding ground for bacteria. So mastitis um, can definitely come on. Basically, mastitis is, usually comes on relatively suddenly. All of a sudden, you'll feel like you have the flu. People call us and they say they feel like they got run over by a truck. A lot of people just say, I think I have the flu. Um, you have fever. Oftentimes, you'll have pain somewhere in the breast. You might, like this picture shows, have um, redness or very warm or hot skin. So it might be very obvious like this, but other times you don't have that redness. Um, and so anytime you're concerned about having some sort of infection um, when you're breastfeeding that comes on very suddenly with a fever, you need to call. Um, mastitis is treated with antibiotics that last about 14 days. Um, so it's a very serious thing. If, if you don't treat it and it doesn't go away on its own, this red area right there um, basically gets worse and worse and it turns into an abscess, which is just like a pus filled wound, basically. And then that requires you to go to the hospital and then you have to have it like surgically removed and cleaned and it's very gross and um, not fun and so if we can just treat it before that happens that would be great so always call us or the lactation center or your other provider whoever you're seeing please please call if you think you have mastitis um, it's very very important to keep nursing you have to keep emptying the breast or keep pumping whatever it is that you do pumping nursing both um, hand expressing we have to get whatever's in there out um, and your baby will not catch the infection so it is safe to continue nursing through mastitis and through the antibiotic mastitis. Um, types of nipples. Oops. Oh, oops. Um, I skipped the slide. I'm sorry. It won't let me go back. I don't know why. So I'm going to pretend I'm still on that last slide. Types of nipples. Um, there are normal nipples, um, flat nipples, and inverted nipples. Um, if you think you have flat or inverted nipples, flat nipples just basically mean that they don't, um, normal nipples would, especially when they get cold or wet, um, will erect and protrude um, and be pokey, pointy. And then flat nipples, um, might not necessarily do that. They're, they're just um, flush with the skin, so they just blend into the rest of your breast, basically. And then the inverted nipples, that the nipple actually like kind of um, goes inward a little bit. Like there's like a little like indent um, in your nipple. Instead of coming out, it goes in. So if you think you have flat or inverted nipples and we haven't talked to you about that yet, please bring that up with us because there are some things that we can do um, to help with that. And, um, or if you think you had problems in the past because of that, then please just let us know and please bring that up. Otherwise, normal nipples, I mean, we can just treat those like normal nipples and um, deal with the latch accordingly. Um, I was looking for a different slide because I thought that there was a slide on um, yeast infections, but I think that might be in the baby section, so we'll just wait for that. Um, how do you know your baby is getting enough? Um, again, you know, babies are gonna often be feeding a lot 
Um, and so you think your baby's not getting enough and that's why it wants to feed all the time, but that's not necessarily true. Um, one way to know um, if your baby's feeding enough is by how much they're peeing and pooping. We're gonna talk in a minute about how much they should be peeing and pooping every day, but we know by their diapers that they're getting enough. If they're not having enough diapers, then maybe they aren't getting enough. Are they gaining weight? Um, pretty much all babies are going to lose weight in the first few days of life. They just lose um, you know, all that extra fluid that was in their lungs and in, in their bodies um, when they were in utero, they lose all of that in the first few days. And then it takes a little bit once, you know, once your milk actually comes in, basically, they start to gain weight after that. So we'll know by weight gain. Um, how you can tell personally after the baby is feeding, you know, their body gets, more, you know, when they're hungry, they're, they're tense, their hands are here, they're <laughs> like making noises and trying to eat. Um, and then after they are done, they're very relaxed, they're calm, they're quiet, often they fall asleep, their hands are relaxed, their body's relaxed, they're content between feeds. Sure, maybe they're only content for an hour or so, but um, they are content, and um, that means that they've gotten enough. Um, if you're nursing on demand, meaning 8 to 12 times a day or more in a 24-hour period, 8 to 12 times a day is every three to four, two to three hours. So if you're nursing that much, then more than likely your baby is getting enough. Um, how do you how do you know like in your breast that your baby's getting enough? You're gonna feel it at the beginning of a feed how full you are, um, and then they're gonna feel much softer and emptier after a feed. You're gonna feel most people will feel that letdown sensation when your milk actually releases from the back of your breast down to the front to come out um, to your baby's mouth. You'll hear your baby swallowing, and um, oftentimes if your baby like pops off the nipple in the middle of a feed, you'll see milk in the baby's mouth. So. Those are all ways that, you know that your baby's getting the milk. Here's the peas and poos that I was talking about. So day one, you should have one wet diaper and one poopy diaper. Now these are minimums. Some babies are gonna have way more than this and that's okay. But minimum would be one wet, one poopy. Day two, two wet, two poopy. Day three, three wet, three poopy. Day four, four wet, four poopy. After day four, um, you have at least three to four poopies a day and five to six wet diapers a day. And again, some people, you know, every single time they feed, they change a diaper, it's full. Um, other babies, anyway, every baby's different, but in general, the first week or so, this is this is considered normal, and that's how we know they're getting enough. These are like di the different types of poop here at the top, this brown, thick poop. The first one on the top left, that's meconium. It's thick, it's black, it's sticky, it's gross. Um, it's normal for the first few days. Then usually it turns um, a kind of a greenish color. Sometimes that only lasts for like one poop. Other times it lasts for a full day. That's just when the um, breast milk hasn't completely come in yet, but they've already gotten rid of the meconium. So it's just like a transitional poop, usually between, between day three and four. And then once the breast milk is really in, and you have a good supply, the milk, the milk will turn a yellow color. Sometimes it looks like there's little seeds in it. They're not seeds, they're um, fat deposits, like just fat globules basically the baby's pooping out. Other babies poop looks really, really watery and all of these are considered variations of normal. The next picture, the, the second row all the way to the right, um, looks like there's a little bit of blood in the poop. Anytime there's any blood in your poop, um, you should call your pediatrician. Um, illness, injury, like a bowel injury, um, allergies to something that you eat, or like milk, um, cow's milk, something like that might be causing blood in their stool. Um, you know, babies can poop a lot, they can poop a little, it can go all the way up their back, it can be as small as a quarter. In general, most poops that we're gonna consider a solid poop is like anything bigger than a quarter and um, multiple times a day. Um, sometimes, you know, the, the pee is very clear and you can't really tell besides the little blue stripe on the diaper. Sometimes it's mixed with stool, um, so sometimes it's not. 100% clear how much the baby has peed, and that's okay. We'll just, you know, we'll do our, take our best guess, basically. Um, sometimes this bottom picture on the left, sometimes um, around day one or two, um, babies can have that orangish, it looks like blood. It's like an orange color um, in their in their stool. It's actually urine, and it's, um, ur uh, it's called uric acid crystals that are in the urine. Um, it's from dehydration. So that, that this can mean that your baby's not getting enough at that time. Usually the answer to that is just feeding more often. Um, usually when we ask moms whose babies have that, um, they either are still working on the latch or they're not feeding as often as they, sh as they should. Um, so please call us if you do see that in your baby's diaper. Um, 
it's not normal, um, but it's common um, sometimes for, for, for a dehydrated baby. Um, usually it's only going to last for like one pee or two peas until your milk really comes in and you get a good supply, but we need to figure out why your baby isn't getting enough if, if that does happen. So different positions with breastfeeding. Um, the first picture here is the cradle position. So the, the, the typical, you just hold your baby here um, position. And the next one is the football or the clutch hold, which was when you hold them down here to the side of you um, and just support their head at your breast. Then the cross cradle is when you use your arm, your whichever arm, to support the baby's head and place it against your breast. Um, then side lying is when you're literally laying on your side just like that and baby just lays on his side and scoots up to you at your breast. And then the laid back position is exactly that. You lay back in a recliner or um, your bed or your couch, wherever, and then the baby lays on you and faces you. Typically in our, in our classes, we do practice this, um, but in general, I would have, I would recommend um, a, a, some sort of like boppy or breastfeeding pillow um, because it's really helpful to keep baby in a good position and keep yourself relaxed so that you're not um, holding the weight of your baby, basically. So remember, we bring the baby to our breast, we relax our shoulders, we don't, we don't hunch over and, and try to, <clears throat> and like try to bring ourselves to the baby, we bring the baby to us. Um, we always tell people to keep like a bottle of water or snacks or both right, like maybe on the nightstand or whatever, the side table, whatever you have next to where you feed um, so that you can also hydrate when your baby hydrates because this is something we don't always remember. So um, importance of hydration still exists after pregnancy for sure. Um, nutrition and medications. So um, you need about 500 extra calories per day to breastfeed. Um, it's super, super important to stay hydrated. Hydration can have an impact a little bit on your breastfeeding supply. So if you're not well hydrated, maybe your supply will go down a little bit. To taking your prenatal vitamins, we recommend that you continue taking a prenatal vitamin or a multivitamin for the extent of all of your breastfeeding life. So as long as you breastfeed, keep taking vitamins um, because you do pass all of those vitamins and nutrients to your baby. Ways of increasing your milk supply. There's all kinds of foods out there. There's those, they sell lactation cookies, lactation smoothies. There's lactation teas, like mother's milk tea, um, fenugreek. Um, there's all kinds of supplements out there. Sprouts has it all, sprouts in a gallon. Um, anyway, oatmeal, anyway. But there's all kinds of, um, things out there that do help your increase your milk supply and um, but in general we always recommend if you want to increase your milk supply you need to put the baby on more if your baby doesn't want to go on more then you can also pump um, so more the more frequent you do that the better your supply will be eating well it's still important to continue eating a well-rounded healthy diet lots of vegetables protein fruit whole grains um, taking medications, you can always call us or um, tell the person giving you the prescription that um, that you are breastfeeding so that they can find something compatible with breastfeeding. If you ever are given an antibiotic and you're not sure if it's compatible with breastfeeding, there's this infant risk center hotline that you can call. Um, you can also call us and we can let you know if it's safe with breastfeeding. Starting solid foods. So again, your babies don't need anything until six months old, um, but at six months, you can, you know, everybody has their own preference. You can feed from a Gerber bottle or a Gerber jar, whatever they're called. Um, some people like to do like a, some form of baby led weaning, which is where you feed them what you eat. You, you know, you can feed them a mashed version or a soft version of anything that you're eating. Like usually fruits and veggies is what we start with. Never give honey um, for the first year of life. We know that that can cause botulism in babies. Um, but in general, you just don't need to give anything until the baby's at least six months old. Um, storing breast milk. Um, so if you need to go back to work or you just like to have an extra, you know, um, storage of breast milk in your freezer or your fridge for times that you're going to be away from your baby for a little while, it can be kept at room temperature for four to six hours um, in the refrigerator for three to five days in the freezer um, for six to nine months. So they also do distinguish between having a side-by-side -side freezer, which means the freezer and the refrigerator are all in one, which is what most people have in their kitchen. Um, so in that freezer, it can only be kept for three to six months. Um, but in a deep freezer, which is like the big chest cube freezer that you might have in your kitchen, or, but a lot of people have it like out in their garage or outside, um, it can be kept for up to 12 months. 
So it's different um, between the type of freezer that you use. Breast milk that is thawed from the freezer and put in the refrigerator, you have to use um, in 24 hours after it's thawed. So you have 24 hours to use it. You can never, ever, ever refreeze breast milk. So if you put it in the fridge, for whatever reason it didn't get used and it was completely thawed, you have to throw it away. Um, there's different things that you can do with breast milk. You know, you can use, some people do breast milk baths. Like you can put the breast milk in the bathtub. It's supposedly really good for the baby's skin. Um, people make breast milk jewelry. They, there's all kinds of things you can really do with breast milk. But in general, you should never give it to your baby um, after 24 hours or refreeze it after 24 hours. Breast pumps, it's important to know that everyone should qualify for a breast pump from their insurance or any Medicaid plan um, will qualify you for a breast pump. It's usually a double electric breast pump, like the one here in the middle of the page, um, which means you pump both at the same time um, and you plug it in. There's also manual pumps, like the pump here on the left, that you can do one, one side at a time, or you can buy two manual pumps and do them both at the same time. If you don't have insurance and you're cash pay, there are, you know, you can buy pumps at Walmart or Target or ask for it for your baby shower or um, things like that because they are expensive. They're a couple hundred bucks. Um, but these little manual ones are like $15, $20. So they do work. They're a little bit more work for you because you have to sit there and pump it with your hand. But it doesn't really fatigue. I mean, they're, they're, they're made very well nowadays. So um it doesn't really like hurt your hand or anything to do it. It just takes more time. So um, anyway, so there's all kinds of options for you if you do need a breast pump. Flange size. So every breast pump comes with the same standard um, flange size, which I, think, which I think is like 24 millimeters. Um, if you think that your nipples are either too large or too small for the for the flange, the flange is the plastic um, the plastic like cone part that goes on your breast. Uh, if you think your nipples are too large or too small, you can let us know or you can ask the lactation center as well um, that we, and we can evaluate you to see um, if you need a different flange size. Um, in general, you know, it look, should look like this here, the correct fit here in the middle. The nipple is not rubbing the sides of the, um, the sides of the, tu um, the plastic, the tube. Um, and the first picture is too small because the nipple doesn't come out enough. The second picture is perfect because it comes out and doesn't, again, doesn't touch the sides. The, sec the third one is too large because part of the areola comes out into the, into the tube as well. So if you need help figuring out what size is best for you, please let us know or we'll get you in with lactation so that they can help you. Can you breastfeed in public? Absolutely, you can breastfeed. The Texas law says that you can breastfeed anywhere that a mother is entitled to be. So if you legally are allowed to be there, then you're legally allowed to breastfeed your baby there. These are just pictures of women that are breastfeeding in public. I think a few years ago, I think it was a senator, a congresswoman, congresswoman, um, was breastfeeding on, on the House floor, like during, I don't know, I forget, something was going on and she was breastfeeding. So you can breastfeed legally wherever you want. Newborn care, um, so we're just gonna talk about just, just a little bit of newborn care here. Infant cues, again, we already talked about hunger, sucking on their hands, putting their hands in their mouth, fidgeting, squirming, looking around for the breast. Um, putting their hands and fists up to their face. They're tired, they yawn, they rub their eyes, they start to like kind of zone out and lose interest in people, they get quiet, they get really still, they clench their fists, their eyes. Um, engagement, baby wants to talk to you, they want to be near to you, they open your eyes, they're looking at you, they're making eye contact, they follow your face, they follow your voice around the room, they smile at you, you know, they want to be engaged, they want your attention. Disengagement, no. This girl is very disengaged, she wants something different, she looks away, she cries, she's throwing a fit, she's extending her fingers, falling asleep, um, jerky movements, grimaces, glazed look, that she's disengaged, she's not interested anymore. Um, safe sleep for baby, we, they've always used to say ABCs, alone, on their back, and in a crib. So that's the safest place for a baby to sleep. Um, we always place babies on their back. It's okay when they're older and they roll over on their own, that's fine. But in general, we should always place a baby to fall asleep on their back um, somewhere alone. No loose sheets or pillows or blankets around them. The room not too hot or too cold. I mean, that that's because when they, anytime a baby dies um, of SIDS, they do a huge investigation of just the environment and what was happening around the baby and one of the things they look at is the temperature of the room and they found that for some reason rooms that are too hot or too cold um, are more likely to cause SIDS. Um, so room temperature, if you're comfortable, your baby should be comfortable. Um, 
you know, they say that babies should um, have about one more layer than than we do um, when they sleep or anytime. So if you are in shorts and a t-shirt, well then put your baby in, you know, pants and long sleeves. Or if you are in shorts and a t-shirt with a thick quilt on you, well then you should put your baby in long sleeves and, um, you know, like a sleeper or long sleeve t-shirt and, and pants and maybe just a really light um, blanket that you swaddle them in. Um, so we don't need baby to be, um, you know, in their sleeper with a blanket, with a big fleece blanket on top of that and their hat. And you don't need excessive heat on a baby. Um, so anyway, just be mindful of how much you're wrapping up your baby, basically. Um, the baby is safest close to the breastfeeding parent. So in your room, on the side of your bed, on your side of the bed, like in their crib or their bassinet or whatever. There's all kinds of places the babies can sleep. Um, there's these little co-sleep loungers, little bassinets. Nowadays they have these like docker tots or sleep separators that you can put. They're kind of in their own little space like this mom has her baby. They're in their own little space but still in your bed. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics now recommends that you share a room with your baby the, for the whole first year of life to reduce it. They used to say six months and now they say one year. Newborn sleep cycles. Um, newborns have about an hour sleep cycle at a time. The first um, half of it is light sleep, lasts for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, rapid eye movement, they dream, they move around a lot, they're easily awoken. And then deep sleep lasts for like the second 20 or 30 minutes. They have deep regular breathing, they don't move much, they're more difficult to awaken. Um, but this is just a constant cycle, um, which is why they might not sleep very long at first. Um, because they're constantly cycling in and out of that deep sleep. Skin issues in babies. So these are really common issues. The first one here is a picture of milia. It's little white bumps that are on their cheeks or their nose or their forehead. They disappear on their own. There's nothing wrong with them. There's really not a whole lot you can do about them. They're just normal little cute bumps on babies' faces and they just go away. Baby acne. Oh, crud. I forgot. I can't come back. Um, this is a picture of baby acne. Um, Pretty common, sometimes it's the result of allergies. Um, and you can clean it, you can clean it with um, like a soft soap um, and a washcloth, but otherwise you don't need to put any creams on it, it'll go away on its own. Um, it's pretty common. Um, cradle cap is, the, is right here on the bottom right, it's the little thick scaly yellowish white plaques on their, on their head. Again, um, you can kind of use one of those little soft brushes and some soap and water and kind of like, or um, or like olive oil or something, something very soft to kind of get it out of their hair. But in general, it's gonna disappear on its own. Um, and there's really not a whole lot you need to do for it. Diaper rash, you know, that's pretty common in babies. Baby's skin is very sensitive, especially to the urine and the poos that they have in their diapers. So it's just um, important to change their diapers as often as you can. There's all kinds of creams, lotions, whatever's out there for, for diaper, um, for diaper rashes. Um, it's just important to note that if, um, if it doesn't go away, the diaper rash, if it does not go away with use of creams or things that you buy at the store in like two to three days, you really should see your pediatrician because it's a um, possibility that it could be like a yeast infection or something that's not going to be treated by things that you can buy at the store. So if it doesn't go away in two or three days, you should be seeing. Warning signs in a baby. Um, any kind of continuous high-pitched cry, I mean this high-pitched cry, it's like a shriek, like it's very loud and screaming almost cry that's like all the time. Um, can just mean that there's something neurologically wrong, um, you should definitely call us if that happens. Rectal temperature above 100.4 and underarm above 99, so babies really for the first like three months or so, they should never have a fever. Um, if, if any baby three months or younger has a fever of 99, um, or higher, you should take them to the pediatrician. They should be seen to figure out what's going on. Um, they don't really recommend rectal temperatures anymore unless you, for some reason, don't have an underarm thermometer or any other way to take their temperature. Um, it, can, it can just cause more harm than good, so they don't, it's not really recommended to do a rectal temperature anymore. Yellow skin or eyes in the first day of life, so in the first 24 hours. So uh, you often see that baby's skin color does change to a yellowish color or, or a little bit in their eyes, like several days after the birth, and, and that's okay, that's common, that's um, normal newborn jaundice, but if you see it in the first 24 hours, it's a major red flag, um, and you need to call us. Um, 
they we will always you know be watching your baby for that while you're here but you don't stay uh usually a full 24 hours here at the birth center so um please call us back before we come to your home visit if you're noticing yellow in the first 24 hours the cord area um if it's very red or you see pus or it's very warm hot hard any of those signs of infection definitely call if you feel like the baby is not eating well or is really lethargic, doesn't have any energy, doesn't want to wake up, you can't get it to wake up, like we talked about before, always call. Diarrhea, that's a little hard to distinguish, I think, sometimes because breast milk poop is so watery anyway. Um, but if you're ever concerned that there is diarrhea, then let us know. Projectile vomiting, definitely a problem. This isn't like normal baby spit up that gets on your shoulder or, you know, on their blanket. Projectile vomiting would be like they vomit and it goes like, three feet away on the floor or, you know, like across the table or across the bed or whatever. Um, definitely call. Difficult rapid breathing or any like bluish or grayish purplish color around the baby's mouth, always call. Cord care and bathing. Um, it's important to keep the cord clean and dry for the first one to two weeks or until it falls off. It'll change in color. It starts to be like this first picture where it's like yellow, white with that clamp, the, the plastic clamp on it. Um, you can, it, you know, and then it gets to be that brown, dry, black looking thing. That's normal. Um, you watch for redness and irritation or pus around it. But in general, you really don't have much, you don't have to do much to keep it clean. They used to say to clean with alcohol. That's not recommended anymore. It's not necessary. Just let it air dry, um, and keep it, you know, clean around it with soap and water. Bathing the baby. Babies don't get very dirty. Um, so really, you only really need to clean the diaper area, maybe a little bit under their neck if they, you know, drip their milk there um, until that cord falls off. You can give your baby a bath. It's not dangerous to give your baby a bath and submerge the baby or to get the cord wet. It's not, you can't not get it wet. It's just only going to prolong how long it takes to dry off basically because, or to fall off because it has to dry off before it falls off. So, um, um, you can give your baby a bath, but if you do, make sure all your supplies are ready. You have, make sure you run warm water, not hot. Always, always test the water before you put your baby in it. And never take your hands or your eyes off the baby when they're in the water. It only takes a second. You turn around for one second to get something, and they could move or turn their head or, or anything. So don't ever take off your baby in the water. There's all kinds of ways you can bathe your baby in sinks and bathtubs. There's all kinds of baby bathtubs out on the market. You can choose whatever form you like. Um, car seats, so it's important for babies to always be rear facing, so facing the back of the car, um, at least for the first year. Some states now require that it's for the first two years, but the state of Texas says one, so they have to be rear facing for at least one year. Your seats should never be expired or used unless you know the owner, like it's your sister or something very close to you. You know that they've um, you know, never been in an accident and they have used it appropriately, then okay. But in general, you need a brand new seat, um, definitely not expired and um, should read the instructions and practice putting um, the car seat in your car before you come to, to us. Um, technically, we cannot help you secure your baby or your car seat in your vehicle um, because we have to be certified in that and um, we're not. <laughs> so, um, in general, you just securely snug, um, securely place your baby in there. Make sure the straps are um, tight. Make sure the clip is at the level of the armpits. No blankets. You can put blankets over top of the um, of the buckle, but not under. Um, no big coats. No puffy coats. No big blankets. Um, it should be very, very snug. The straps should be snug on the baby. This is a picture of just the rear-facing car seat. It's facing backwards towards the back of the car. The first picture on the left is not correct because the um, the buckle is all the way down here, kind of below the baby's nipples. That's not good. If you were to get in a car accident, um, that that um, buckle could damage some of the baby's organs and cause like internal injury. The picture on the right is correct because it's all the way up to the baby's um, armpits. You know, we have this big hard. Um, sternum, the, the, the big bone here, and that is not going to be, that's what's going to take the impact, and it should because it's very tough and durable, um, and it won't cause any internal damage when it hits the baby's chest like that. So that's where the strap should always be, and those straps should always be very tight like that picture. They shouldn't be loose. They shouldn't be saggy. Um, baby shouldn't be able to get its arms out, nothing like that. Ways of calming babies. Um, responding immediately, making sure their physical needs are met. Are they hungry? Do they need a diaper change? 
burped, were they too hot, too cold, bored, tired? Um, you know, babies cry a lot sometimes. So, you know, the risk period for shaken baby syndrome and postpartum blues, you know, the first couple of weeks, but really anytime, I mean, toddlers cry a lot. Like uh, we're all home right now with this whole COVID thing. We're all home with our kids a lot. Some of us are home 24 seven with our kids and we don't really get a break. So um, if you can ask for help, step away. If you ever are so frustrated and overwhelmed and you want to shake your baby, you need to put that baby in a safe place like a crib um, and walk away. You need to walk outside, go scream in a pillow somewhere, you know, do whatever you have to do that's away from the baby. But you need to take a break, take a deep breath before you go back in there. Um, and if you are noticing that you're doing that a lot, like every day or several times a week, you're finding yourself so overwhelmed that you have to put your baby down and walk away, please call us. Please, please tell us. Please reach out and let us know that that's how you're feeling. Um, you know, it's something to be ashamed of. We want you, we will support you. We want you to feel supported and we want to help you and um, get through that. So, um, calming the baby, uh, skin to skin, wearing them close to you. If you have a sling or any kind of baby carrier, you can, um, any kind of baby wearing is great for baby and keeping the baby calm. Swaddling the baby, which is just wrapping the baby really tight in, in a blanket where they look like a little burrito. Um, baby, you know, every baby's different. Some babies like music, some like white noise, some don't like any noise. Um, they like to suck on like a pacifier or your finger or your nipple, of course, that's why they want to eat. So um, that's very soothing for them, and that's something that they want sometimes. Baby massage. There's all kinds of YouTube videos you can look up, up out there about baby massage, infant massage. Um, the Wonder Weeks book and app. So the Wonder Weeks, um, it is a – how do I explain it? It's kind of like a um, – it's, it's, it's studied. Um, really hard to explain. Um, it's a book, and it basically talks about – the different stages of development in your baby, um, how they go through periods where they're going to be fussy and emotional and that basically they correlate with certain like developmental growth spurts, basically. I'm not really sure how to explain it. Um, anyway, so some people will notice that if their baby is really, really fussy or really a mess all of a sudden that they look at this book or they look at this app and they're like, oh, sure enough. Like you, I think you put in your baby's due date or something like that and it, I don't know. It correlates. It gives you this whole calendar and like correlates with like your baby's due date and when it will be fussy and when it won't. And there's actually some research behind it. So it's just something to look at. That's something you might interested in. Baby wearing, tons of benefits for baby wearing. Breastfeeding benefits. You can breastfeed while you're baby wearing. You can be skin to skin. Um, it causes a happy caregiver because you actually are hands free and can be able to do your own thing and get more things done promotes emotional and mental well-being for the mom. Baby's brains, um, baby's brain development and social skills are better because they're up here at adult level. Eye contact, they are like kind of interacting and talking, you know, to you. A happy baby. Babies who are carried cry 43% less. Of course they do because every baby wants to be carried. Um, so anyway, there are ways to carry your baby with these carriers that allow you to, um, still have your hands free to do whatever you want and your baby is happy because you're carrying it. Um, proper positioning helps with spine development, helps with tummy troubles and good digestion because of the way that you're kind of like rocking them when you walk. So lots of great benefits for baby wearing. You can find baby carriers at Target, Walmart, online, Bye Bye Baby, any of those kinds of places. They carry baby carriers. There's slings. This picture on the left, this blue carrier is a wrap. The pink and I guess pink and red and orange one is a a uh, ring sling, and then the one in this picture over here, the black and white one, um, is a soft structured carrier, I think. It's like a buckle carrier. It buckles around your waist, and then it's like a little backpack, basically, that you put your baby in. It's really convenient. So usually, again, we usually practice diaper changes, massage, swaddling, baby carrying. So um, if you have any questions about how to do any of these things, please ask us at one of your appointments, and we'd be happy to go over it with you. The postpartum period, um, it's important to have a plan for postpartum. I know right now it's probably kind of hard to have a plan because we're supposed to be social distancing and um, not having people over. Um, but 
it's important to know who's going to help with meal prepping, cleaning, holding the baby so that you can go take a nap or so that you can go take a shower, um, breastfeeding support. It's important to have people around that, especially if you want to breastfeed, that are going to be supportive of that and encourage you and um, help you. Um, so meal prep, you know, if people aren't going to be able to bring you meals um, or be there to cook for you, then I would encourage you to start now or start, you know, a few weeks before you're due to like start sticking, you know, make maybe making some things, sticking them in the freezer or buying freezer meals, buying meals that are going to be easy to make or easy for your partner to make um, postpartum. Cleaning, if you don't have help with it, it can wait just or your partner can help. <laughs> um, I don't, you know, especially for that first week, you really just need to be resting. You need to be spending time with your baby, sleeping, um, healing from childbirth. Um, and I mean, I would say, I mean, a week minimum, like you really should rest as much as you can. Um, but remember to bathe, remember to eat, remember to drink, you know, we, as moms, we put our baby's needs before our own and we realize that we haven't eaten all day or no, we haven't drank any water today or you're right, I haven't showered in three days or whatever it is. So it's important to still meet your own needs as well and to not be afraid to ask for help. Some needs that you might have, a need for somebody to talk to, to feel mothered yourself, to feel protected, to talk about your labor and birth. Um, you know, maybe it didn't go like you thought it would. Maybe you're disappointed. Maybe you thought you were going to have a water birth and you delivered on, in the bathroom, or you thought you were going to have a birth center birth and you ended up at the hospital, or you thought you were going to get a vaginal delivery and you ended up with a C-section, or there's all kinds of things that, um, you know, we all have hopes and dreams and um, thoughts about how our birth experience is going to be, and it doesn't always turn out that way, and um, it's important to be able to talk about that with somebody. Um, close to you. You can also talk about that with us. Um, the need for private time, alone time, even if that's just in the shower or taking a bath. Paying attention to your own psychological and emotional state, even if others are not, um, because you're under a lot of stress and your hormones are changing and you're not sleeping and there's just a lot going on. So it's important to pay attention to your own like emotional being. Postpartum depression um, is very real. It's very common. Um, it's nothing that you do really to cause it. Um, it's nothing to be ashamed of. We want you to reach out to us and let us know if you think you are depressed. Um, even if you this is your fourth, fifth baby and you never had postpartum depression before, it does not matter. It doesn't mean that you can't have it now. Um, and it's okay. And so some of the symptoms are feeling anxiety, panic, Aversion, not wanting to touching the baby, like you don't want to touch the baby, you're afraid to hurt the baby, you can't sleep. Um, common like uh, comments are that you feel absolutely nothing towards the baby, the simplest tasks are too much for you, you don't want to get out of bed, you spend all day in bed, um, or you're having a rapid heartbeat, you can't sleep, you can't eat, all you're doing is crying, anything like that going on, please, please call us, let us know. We're going to ask you anyway. Every time we see you and talk to you, we always ask about how you're doing emotionally. Um, we're gonna ask you at both your home visits, any of your postpartum visits, but if any time between any of those visits, you're feeling any of those things, then please reach out to us or have your partner reach out to us um, as well. Postpartum self-care, again, you need to sleep, you need to stay hydrated, you need to stay well-nourished, so eating, um, movement, get up, get out of bed, try to, you know, go outside, sit on your porch, take a walk around your house, come back inside, take a walk with your baby, go push your baby in the stroller, down a sidewalk or around your house, um, and emotional support, um, yeah, again, to talk to your partner, or your sister, or your mom, whoever it is that um, you can talk to about what you're, what you're going through and what you're feeling. Um, that's it. So in conclusion, um, listen to your intuition, listen to your body, listen to your baby. You can do this. Um, thank you very much. If you have any questions about anything we've covered, just place them um, below in the comments, or you can also bring um, your questions to a visit, and we'd be happy to talk to you about them. And just let us know at the end of the video that you completed it and we will go from there. Thank you. We'll see you again soon.